in church. Hallelujah. For those that are visiting, we are in the book of Luke. It's been an incredible study. The first three chapters serve as introduction to really set up the ministry of Jesus. Of course, as we're well aware, Luke spends no time recording the Judean ministry, but jumps right into the Galilean ministry in chapter 4. We've been through that the last several weeks, and today we'll reach, so to speak, the pinnacle of that ministry when Peter finally realizes that Jesus is the Christ of God. Afterwards, we find that Jesus begins his journey to Jerusalem in chapters 9 through 19. The title of the lesson today, The Escalating Resistance to the Revolution. Point one, the revolution's multiplication, verses 1 through 17. Point two, the revolution's revelation, verses 18 through 50. And point three, the revolution's resolution, verse 51 through 62. Let's get into our text. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Right here we see the beginning of the multiplication ministry of Jesus Christ. He's been walking with the disciples now for quite some time. And now he pulls those 12 that he is called to be with them. And he now sends them out to preach the kingdom and to heal every kind of disease. We know from some of the synoptic gospels that they go out two by two. And so now Jesus has multiplied himself into 12 preachers that believe in the kingdom of God. You know, I think it's very interesting that people sometimes, I think, try to super-spiritualize the message They say, well, I just preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. And certainly that's a scripture that we need to be mindful of. And yet when we also look at the companion book written by Luke, the book of Acts, the very last scripture in the very last chapter talks about Paul being in prison. And what's Paul doing? He is preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about Jesus Christ. You cannot separate teaching about Jesus for preaching the kingdom of God. See, a lot of people don't have the kingdom to preach about because they're really not in it. When you're in the kingdom, when you're in God's church, you got something to talk about. You see someone on the street, you're fired up about the church, say, hey, you got to come and see my church. Why? Because you want them to come and see Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. It is the witness to a lost world by its love, one for another. Are you with me here, church? You see, the disciples went out preaching the kingdom and healing every kind of disease. And, of course, that's our physician evangelist Luke making that little notation right there. But what it implies is that they met every need. See, that's our job as we go out and preach the word is, yes, we want to preach God's word. We want people to be saved. But we want to meet their felt need. When you serve people, then they're going to be open to the message of the kingdom. You know, I find it fascinating right here in what's called the limited commission, as opposed to the great commission that is to all nations. The limited commission here is just to the Jews. You find it also recorded in Matthew chapter 10. And very interestingly, for this charge, 
She used to say, take nothing. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. The point, easy, depend on God. You know, we live in a time where, where people say, don't get too dependent. Don't get dependent on people. Don't. No, no, no. You are to depend on God. And it's very interesting. I've always kind of skipped over this thing. It says, take no staff, no bag, no... No, no bag? What was it? Did one of those non-disposable bags, you know, to Ralph's or something? I don't know what it was. Now, the bag right here actually is, is something that preachers and philosophers used in that day to carry around their money or to use it for people to put money into after they preached or they talked. So he says, hey, don't take the bag. No money. <laughs> and then he says, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Now, that's very different than a lot of itinerant preachers. Because Jesus' ministry taught fundamentally about discipleship. And for discipleship to take place, you've got to be with someone. There's got to be, so to speak, a base. That's why we have Bible talks. Those are our bases. And so people can come into a home and they can see real live Christianity there. And so by the disciples staying in these people's homes, there was a life transfer. Are you with me right here? See, there's no way to really get discipled unless you're really with people. That's what discipleship is all about. It's not just copying the words. It's not just coming to church. It's walking with people. It's, get this, living with people and imitating their life. He says, however, if the people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet. Now, that's, that's not a figurative expression. This was a, a very common Jewish practice. When a Jew came out of a Gentile country, in order to make it clear to that country and those people that they were unclean, they would literally <laughs> shake off their dust from their feet to say, you are not with God. I have nothing to do with you. And so when people would not receive the disciples, they go, they said, what's that all about? Jesus told us to do it. Because he wants you to know you are not right with God. See, Jesus was all about comforting the disturbed and disturbing the comfortable. You know, it's interesting to me. It almost sounds redundant in verse 6. So they set out, went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. What's the point? <laughs> they did what they were commanded to do. <laughs> and the impact of this new movement was surging. People everywhere were being impacted by the multiplying ministry of Jesus. Well, how far did it extend? Verse 7. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this that I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Of course, this is Luke trying to once more raise before us the issue of who is Jesus? Who is this guy that heals people everywhere? Who is this guy that all of Galilee is coming out to see? Who is this guy that's multiplying preachers to go out into all the towns and villages under my charge, as Herod would see it? And I find it fascinating that it says, and he tried to see him. You know, we a lot of times think controversy or rumors hurt our efforts. No, no, no. It got Herod's attention. And he goes, man, I got to see what this is about for myself. And, you know, it sets up, of course, the famous scene in Luke 23. And you'll have to be there for that Sunday to hear all about that. <laughs> Now, let's uh, move on here to verse 10. <clears throat> when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Let's just stop right there. Jesus believed in accountability. He sent the apostles out, and then they had him come back. 
Mark 6.31 says, they reported to Jesus what they had done and taught. You know, we understand, those of us that are in business, that accountability is necessary. We understand, those of us that have families, that accountability is necessary, particularly the homework stuff. How much more so the most important thing in our life, the kingdom. And yet so many churches shrink back from accountability. Why would that be? Because people don't want to be held accountable for their lives. They don't want people to really see what's going on. And yet the true seeker of Christ goes, hey, whatever I need to change, whatever I need to do, hey, help me. Here's my life. Show me what I need to do. And as disciples of Jesus, we should welcome accountability. So that's part of discipleship. It's when you walk with someone, you want someone to know you. I, I couldn't help but be moved by Rebecca's words. Say, hey, I just want, I want you just to know me. And I, I want to know you. Wow, that's, that's a disciple's heart. But if there's no accountability in your life, then you've really got to ask yourself, are you really walking with Jesus? Because when we follow our, our own instincts, it's going to take us away from the path of Jesus. Let's move on. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. It's kind of interesting right here. I mean, he tries to get away just for some time with the Lord and some time with the disciples, but the crowds follow, and Jesus generously gives of himself. Have you ever felt that time where you just didn't want to go to that study? And yet after you went, how good did it feel? Let's read on. Remember now, we're talking about the revolution's multiplication. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. Now, that tells us something. Anytime Luke talks about a remote place, a lonely place, we know they have gone there purposely to pray. So when Jesus talks about trying to get away for some rest, Rest to Jesus is not putting up an umbrella, sitting back and getting some suntan oil on. <laughs> Rest to Jesus is extra time to pray to get reinvigorated and to be strengthened for the work of God. Oh, you know, a lot of us wonder, why am I so weary? Why am I so tired? Yes, you have a demanding schedule. Yes, you're doing a lot for the Lord, but you're not spending the kind of time with God that's going to replenish you. Well, it looks like right here the disciples are sensitive guys. The 12 come to them all. I mean, all as a group. Hey, Jesus, getting late in the afternoon. we got to let these people go, man. You've been preaching now three or four hours, and golly, we got to, we got to, you know, these people need a place to, to sleep, and they got to eat. And Verse 12. He says, well, you give them something to eat. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples except for the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Is that cranking or not? Well, there's a couple easy points that we find here. First of all, the fact that there were 5,000 men. Matthew adds women and children, too. But 5,000 men were satisfied with five loaves of bread and two fish. That's a cranking miracle. <laughs> and if you're thinking that that somewhat parallels the 5,000 in Acts chapter 4, you're absolutely right. Same author, 5,000 men were now in the kingdom of God, satisfied with Jesus. 
You sisters know how tough it is to satisfy your guy <laughs> with a good meal. 5,000 guys, and they're all satisfied. You got to give it up to the Lord right there. Well, it's, it's easy the first point because every person is satisfied by Jesus. You know, I wasn't quite the, the football player that our, our dear brother Sal Velasco was. Sal, Sal went on and played uh, college ball at the University of Hawaii, and I'm not going to mention the fact that he was a kicker, but amen. Um, but uh, my, my, my senior year, we were three and five. That's cranking football team. And every now and then, we'd score a touchdown. And they had this one cheer, you know, the cheerleaders would go, but are you satisfied? And the crowd would go, oh, no, because we scored way too few touchdowns. <laughs> but are you satisfied? Oh, no. You know, sadly, sometimes if you'd ask that to disciples, but are you satisfied? They'd go, oh, no. And yet we live in a world that tries to offer satisfaction to every sense that we have. And disciples go after all those things, yeah. trying to find it. Yeah, How much more so the people, the pagans of the world, run after all these things? Yeah. You know, I loved it when uh, a few weeks ago, Theresia was sharing up here right before her baptism. Yeah. And for those that don't know her, she's a, a young lady, 17 years old. She's from Brazil. She's a model. That means she's pretty good looking. <laughs> and most people say, well, if someone's good looking, they, they must not have too many needs. I mean, she's beautiful. What does she need God for? But you know, it's kind of interesting. Her story is amazing. She saw Colleen Untalan and another girl studying the Bible. And she kind of overheard the whole conversation. And then after it was done, she went up to Colleen. And she goes, hey, do you think that you could study the Bible with me? See, people are hungry. Because there's nothing in this world that will satisfy them. Absolutely nothing. I think another thing to draw out from this particular event is the use of numbers itself. In our former fellowship, there's been a great deal of controversy over the use of numbers. And certainly if you try to motivate people solely by numbers, yes, that can be wrong. And yet right here, without question, you got to say, numbers used a lot. First of all, in verse 12, he talks about the 12. Now, that's important because it signals these are the men upon whom Jesus is going to build the new kingdom as opposed to the 12 sons of Jacob with the old kingdom of Israel. Next, we find the five loaves and the two fish. Why is that significant? Because there aren't very many of them. Then there's the 5,000 men. That's a bunch of them. Then there's the groups of 50 that Jesus asked the disciples to break everybody up in. Well, that's pretty easy. Number one, it's easier for distribution. But number two, it's easier to count that way. So you have an accurate count of how many people were fed that day. And then finally, the 12 basket full of leftovers. What's the point there? Well, 12 represents the kingdom. And in the kingdom, he's saying you're going to be more than satisfied. Wow. Now, think about it. If this account would have simply said, some of the guys talked to Jesus about the crowd. They came with some bread and a little bit of fish. And Jesus was able to feed everybody. And everybody went home fine, satisfied. It, it wouldn't have the punch. You see, numbers give us a sense of perspective that allows us to see the hand of God. Yeah. I mean, even think about it, even with ourselves. I mean, think about it. The church here was planted just a little bit over 11 months ago with 42 disciples from Portland. Since that time, we've had 94 people baptized. Is that incredible? We've had 58 people restored, 70 people placed membership. And you go, wow, 
That is God. That's God. But you know, you also have to kind of wrestle with some of the other things that are going on right here. Without question, there's a parallel. And we know this from John chapter 6, that he's alluding to the manna and the quail. And we'll see more parallels coming up with Moses a little bit later. I think the thing that's very interesting, without question here, is the fact that Jesus multiplies in order to meet everybody's needs. When you look at what God has done in this church, you say, that's awesome. But you see, the multiplication of disciples, the multiplication of churches is just now beginning. We, we did have an incredible time last weekend in New York City. I mean, we had 20 disciples from here meet up with about five disciples there in New York, right in downtown New York in Times Square. And DJ picked a heck of a hotel for us all to be in, the Hotel Carter. This one could have been in a, in a horror movie. I walk, I walk into my room, and there's only one light. It's dangling from a little string with nothing on it. There's no chair in the room. The, the walls are like this. And then I, someone asked, well, where's DJ staying? Oh, he's staying with George and Charmin up at their place. Anyway, while the rest of us were being disciples, we... But seriously, it was, it was incredible, guys. I mean, we went out Saturday afternoon and just, just went out and scoped out New York City and then came back at dinner time and shared, just shared our vision for this city of 20 million lost souls. Think about it. 20 disciples from the baby, baby City of Angels Church are going to a city of 20 million people. The odds? A million to one. That's what the Lord wants. You know, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome going to Honolulu and getting everything fixed up over there for the mission team to go over to Honolulu. The remnant group there is on fire for God. In that remnant group are five former full-time ministry guys. And they are wanting to have a church to evangelize not just the islands, but the entire Pac Rim. I'm excited that the Sullivans are going to be going down to Santiago, Chile. Because you see... The Sullivans lead Phoenix right now, and the Lord has taught them a lot right there. But we've got to go down and build Santiago, Chile. That is our base to evangelize all of South America. Who's going to support them? We are. Now, think about it. We're a baby church, but look at what the multiplication of disciples is just now beginning to do. And we get to be a part of God's work. Does that excite you or not? Amen, church? Let's move on. The revolution's revelation. Verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Oh, wow. We could just camp on this verse. Any time in the book of Luke that you find Jesus or his disciples praying, you can be sure something Awesome is going to happen. Now, interestingly enough, I love this line. Jesus was praying in private with his disciples. <laughs> Man, I love that. So many disciples. I want my privacy. I want my space. For Jesus, being in private was being with his closest disciples. And it's very interesting terminology. You will find as you go through this latter part of Luke, that sometimes he talks about the 12, as we have previously, and then sometimes he talks about the disciples that are with him. Why? Well, now we have the women that we talked about in the earlier chapter are now with him, you see. They are part of that intimate circle. They're not part of the 12, but the principle of the 12 applies not only to the men, but to the women. Are you with me right here, church? So Jesus is with this group, and he says, hey, guys, who do the 
crowds say that I am. Once more, Luke is prompting the question, who is Jesus? They say, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah. Still others say that one of the prophets long ago has come back to life. What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Christ, the Messiah of God. I mean, I don't know, but I just sense a tingle up your feet. You are the Christ. Yeah. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, was the greatest born of woman. That side of the kingdom. Elijah called down fire from heaven and defeated 450 false prophets. One of the prophets of long ago, those were the people that Jesus Reminded him of. You gotta understand, the people had a sense that Jesus was from God. You ever get that sense when you're around somebody? You just know you can't put your finger on it, just quite kind of exactly, but you go, He's from God. She's from God. I can feel it. I sense the Spirit. And the people understood Jesus was from God. But Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up. He says, you are the Christ of God. You are the Messiah. Wow. Now look at the next line. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of law, and must be killed, and on the third day raised to life. Hold it! All this time we're talking about proclaim the kingdom. And now Jesus says, now that he finally got that he's the Messiah, don't tell anybody. (laughs) Why? The answer is quite simple. Peter and the gang still didn't understand the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. And Jesus explains it short right here. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things. It's a suffering Messiah. Be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law. He's a rejected Messiah. And he must be killed. We look at most people that are suffering, that are rejected, and we say they are cursed of Satan. And Jesus, this is the kind of Messiah I am. But after I'm killed, on the third day, I'll be raised to life. That's awesome. (laughs) Look at verse 23. He explains it more. They said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world? And yet lose or forfeit his very self. If anyone's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God, before they see the church come there in Acts chapter 2. Amen? You know, I've I've read this passage and studied this passage many times, but I, I didn't quite get one of the innuendos of it. He's talking to that intimate group, and he says... If anyone would come after me, well, the implication there is, I'm going first. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm going first, but if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to go down exactly the same path. That's the Messiah he is. Most of us attribute, if someone has suffering and rejection, hey, there must be a lot of sin in your life. Well, that's, that can bring suffering and rejection, granted. But suffering and rejection often comes because you're standing as a light to the truth, and the world hates that light. It hates being exposed. And Jesus says, hey, if you come after me, first of all, you got to deny yourself. Secondly, you got to take up your cross Every day. See, Jesus talked about being a disciple 24-7, seven days a week. 
That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is radical, guys. He says, if you want to save your life, you got to lose it. He says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world? Think about this. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet to lose or forfeit your life? You know, I, I know we, we're in a recessionary time right now. And I know a lot of the brothers and sisters here are going after their jobs. And I commend you to do a great job and be a light there. But somewhere there's a line that you cross that you give your life for your job instead of for Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to give my life for my job so I can give a lot of money to the church. No, no, that's not what you're thinking. Right here, Jesus says, come after me. That means any person that's a follower of Jesus has got to have this kind of commitment. Right now, there's a very popular teaching that there are different levels of commitment in the church. That is not the teaching of God's word. There is but one standard, there is but one ideal, and that's what Jesus calls people to. So, today, when Vanessa gets baptized, she is going to hold to the standard of Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? She's going to deny herself, tape across daily, and follow Jesus. Today, when Rebecca and Nicole came on forward, they said, listen, I am so sorry I let down the Lord. I went back on my good confession. But now... I'm going to be a sold-out disciple for Jesus Christ. No apologies for that. You know, a lot of people come into the congregation here and they go, oh, man, this church has got so much spirit, so much, so much love. I love it. But, but there's a price for that. There's a price. Say, well, what's the price? Everything you have. Everything you are. Everything you've dreamed. That's what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we cannot be apologetic. Peter has made his good confession. Jesus is the Christ. Now, let's watch the second confession. Let's move on in the text. Verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James. There's the disciple. You see that? Discipling the few right there. He took Peter, John, and James with him, and he went up onto a mountain to pray. Oh, baby. They're praying. Something's going to happen. As he was praying... The appearance of his face changed. And his clothing became bright as a flash of lightning. That means his body became so bright, it just shone through the clothes. <laughs> Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. That would be a cranking fellowship conversation. They spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Now, this is very interesting. It is correctly translated departure, but it really misses the point. The Greek word there is exodon. So it says they spoke about his exodus, referring back to the exodus that Moses led. They spoke about his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter's companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Man, those guys get a lot of sleep, don't they? <laughs> now, Luke makes this point for a very important reason. He wakes them up to make sure we understand this is not a dream. This really happened, guys. This is, a, this is really happening. There's a cranking fellowship conversation between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And they're like dazzling. And there's Peter, James, and John. They're waking up. Oh, boy. Wow. wow. As the men were leaving, 
Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Oh, baby. A voice came from heaven saying, This is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. There's a lot of imagery here that God intended. Yes, you're correct to say that Moses stands for the law. And yes, Elijah stands for the prophets. And that passes, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. But there's more. The glory that's there has to remind us of Exodus 34, when Moses' face was glorious. The cloud that enveloped also reminds us of the time that Moses was on the mountain and being with God. And to think that the disciples just had a taste of being in the cloud. Very interestingly, also translated a little bit shy of the mark, is let us put up three shelters. That word could be translated and should be translated, let us put up three booths. You see, what Peter was trying to do right here, he wanted to celebrate the feast of the tabernacles, the feast of the booths that celebrated the exodus. And it was one of the most joyful celebrations, and that's why you find him in, in good cheer right here. Master, it's, it's good for us to be here. I mean, he, he thought this was something that needed to be done, this celebration. And so he says, hey, let us set up three booths, one for Jesus, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And Jesus said, no, that's not going to be necessary, pointing to the superiority of Jesus over Moses. Now, very interestingly, we just had Peter's confession. You are the Christ of God. Now, we have God's confession. This is my son, whom I've chosen. Listen to him. Well, those words, obviously, were not for Jesus. It referred back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Flip back there quickly. Deuteronomy 18, 15. This is Moses talking. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your people, from your own brothers. You must listen to him. See, right here, God reiterates the good confession of Peter. But he also underlines the fact that Peter and the gang still don't fully understand what kind of Messiah Jesus is. Now, this is further emphasized by the silence at the very end. I mean, it's, it's, it must have been a breathtaking moment. The disciples kept this to themselves. Now, Peter later records it in 2 Peter chapter 1. But they don't say anything to, to the other guys when they get on down. It was such an awe-inspiring experience. But now we have three events right in a row that I want to read to you that are perhaps might be perplexing at first, but I think well explained very easily. Verse 37. The next day. Well, that means probably that... This whole transfiguration took place at night, making the transfiguration even more glorious. Can you imagine that, guys? The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son, for he is my only child. Luke's always getting those little heartstrings right there. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, so he foams to the mouth. It scarcely leaves him, and he is destroying him. I beg you disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him into the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at his greatness. While everyone was marveling at all this that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they didn't understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they didn't grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. 
right here, we see that right when they come down from the mountain, they try, the other disciples are trying to cast out the demon, and they fail to cast it out. Secondly, Jesus talks about the fact that he's going to be betrayed into the hands of men. And the verse says in verse 45 that the disciples failed to understand really what this meant. Then, in verse 46, an argument started amongst the disciples to which would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes one who sent me. For he who is least among you is the greatest. Right here, they fail to understand what it meant to be, to be great in the kingdom of God. Failure to cast out the demon. Failure to understand betrayal. That's what it took with Jesus. And failure ultimately to understand what it meant to be great in the kingdom. To be great in the kingdom is to walk with God. Is to trust like a little child. Why the succession of three failures? Because Luke wants us to understand that every natural instinct we have on how to follow Jesus is wrong. And you got to listen. You got to listen. That's what God said. Listen to him. I think that a lot of us are so confused by the suffering and rejection that comes our way. And it just shatters our faith. Because we're not following the right Messiah. We have a Messiah that simply has a happy ending to every day. Instead of a Messiah that takes us down a road of suffering, rejection, and death. As a matter of fact, even his disciples would go, uh-oh, he's suffering, he's rejected, ah, he must have done something really wrong if he got this fellowship for that. You see, We've got to come to a conviction that we need to listen to the Word of God. Amen. You know, while in Hawaii, it was, it, was, it was so awesome to be there, the little remnant group, about 15 disciples. And uh, now the remnant group is being led by Jody Terrell. Now, Jody was baptized in 1991 and later became the leader of the Cross and Switchblade ministry in the Hawaiian Islands. Full-time guy. I mean, this Jody is incredible. His wife, Uwe, is amazing. Well, he got baptized in 1991, and then his mom got baptized in 1992. Well, the years go by, and seemingly everything's great for Jody, and, and Joyce is his mom. And then, in all these years, you know, she's praying for her husband, Tilly, to, to become a Christian. But he doesn't. But she still perseveres in her faith. In 2003, Jody falls away. Her son that led her to the Lord. She still perseveres. The fellowship that she had loved and even been baptized through begins to dissolve. And she hears about what's going on with Joseph and Mary. And she, she visits and says, man, that's where the spirit is at. She says, I'm going there to sustain herself spiritually. She goes, and Jody and Uwe aren't going. As a matter of fact, she drug them to a retreat that Elena and I went to go over to. And Jody was just rock hard, and we just had a hard talk. But the next morning, Joyce came up to me and says, I can't believe it. Jody had his first quiet time for five years. She was so excited. She said, I've been praying for that, and I know he's going to come back. Just about five months ago, Jody was restored. Amen. Two weeks ago, Joyce's husband, 71 years old, Tilly, was baptized. Amen. Now, for a lot of us, here's this woman who suffered by being married to a non-Christian. But she was strong. She was rejected when her son left God. 
She was rejected by her former fellowship, but she stayed true to her convictions. In her perseverance, she understood that suffering and rejection was all a part of God's plan. By her faithfulness, Uwe started attending. Then Jody started attending. Jody was restored. And then her husband of 43 years, Tilly was baptized. She was, she was so fired up. She says, she's just talking to the brothers and sisters that last Friday night. And she goes, it's so exciting. You know, I get to do what all of you guys get to do now. I get to pray with my husband. <laughs> she was just so excited. I get to pray with my husband. See, she understood perseverance. Because, you see, she had an understanding of what it really took. That what Jesus as her Messiah meant was a suffering, rejected Messiah. You know, I appreciated one of the brothers came to my house Wednesday night, had questions about the finances. He says, bro, you've been pushing the church hard. And I appreciate Ron Harding coming on over. Amen. And he says, bro, I just want to understand. And I just laid it out what we are all about. We are all about saving the world. This life our means mean nothing. We talked about New York. We talked about what we saw. We talked about our, my coming trip to Honolulu. He said, but why do we have to support Santiago? It's a foreign country. Precisely. That's our base to evangelize an entire continent of six million lost souls. This is serious business. Serious. We've got to understand very, very strongly the revelation of God. Jesus is the Messiah. But don't let your instincts be the ones that tell you how to follow him. You listen. Follow the word of God. That's the Messiah we're following. Let's finish up our lesson. The revolution's resolution. Verse 51. As a time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Oh, baby. He's got his bead on Jerusalem. And he sent messages on ahead who went into Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. See, the Samaritans were half-breeds. They, they were kind of intermarried between the Jews. And... Jesus did not look upon them as Gentiles. But the Jews disdained them because they were half-breeds and therefore, in their minds, unfaithful in the faith. Now, the Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerizim. The Jews, of course, worshipped in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And so we have a little indication right here. It says, verse 53, But when the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem, they knew he was heading there to worship and therefore, they reject him. Verse 54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy him? It's always good to have some zealous disciples with you, right? Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, let's go on to another village. You know, I can't help but feel this does apply to us. We look at people that don't respond. People that sort of have faith. You know what I'm talking about now? Yeah. People that should know better, at least they got some blood in them. And some of us go, let's just nuke them. <laughs> that is the most un-Jesus approach there is. On, See, the whole point of Jesus, there will be a day of reckoning. This is not a Messiah you mess around with. But he is a Messiah of grace. As a matter of fact, it's his grace that's allowed all of us to be saved. He could have come sooner, before we were all baptized. But he waits in heaven. And yes, we suffer down here because of it. But he waits in heaven, why? So that more will be saved. And I'm telling you, if you have a disdainful attitude about Samaritans... People who should know, you'll never get those Samaritans to come. 
But isn't it interesting that when the time comes in Acts chapter 8, that when the gospel finally gets to Samaria through Philip, there's an unprecedented mass revival. Why? Because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's move on. 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Right here in these three would-be disciples, two of them are volunteers, and the middle one Jesus calls. And each one serves as a warning to us. The first one who says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. That sounds pretty good. But Jesus lays it out about what that means. The suffering, the rejection. He says, hey, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, son of man is nowhere to lay his head. He says, you follow me, it means total alienation from the world. Other guy says, hey, come follow me. Well, let me first go bury my father. Well, the Jews held family in a very high regard. And Jesus says, hey, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Proclamation is all about seeking first the kingdom. That takes precedence even over your physical family. There are people today, I think even in our congregation, that try to separate and compartmentalize different parts of Christianity. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then you receive everything that you want. I'm here to tell you, Joyce has a Christian husband, has a son that's faithful because she proclaimed the kingdom through suffering and rejection. I think one of the things that as a congregation, we've got to really look at our proclamation. Several of our Bible talks have had just one or two visitors. And perhaps... Like me, you've, you've been, quote, doing the Lord's work in other places. Amen. On the other hand, we, we've got to get focused here, guys. We, we, there are so many people that are hurting. And if you've got a sense inside of you that your schedule's been too busy to proclaim the kingdom, then repent. You need to start chopping some things off. You need to start prioritizing time. Yes, your family's important. Yes, you need to have great time with your wife. Yes, great time with your kids. But that shouldn't necessarily consume you. Your life is about Jesus. And when your wife and your family, your husband or your parents see Jesus, eventually they're going to respond. Yes, you may suffer now. Yes, you may be rejected now. But in the end, that's their hope. Is your faithful proclamation of the kingdom of God first. Are you with me right there? As a church, we need to collectively repent on this one. We need to be a lot bolder in our proclamation. You know, it's really neat being with that New York mission team. I mean, we, you know, it's a funny thing. When you're on a mission team, you go, why am I in New York City? Because I'm on a mission team, I'm supposed to preach the word. You know what I mean? And so then it becomes quite clear. You go, I'm here to preach the word. You know, one of the things that was interesting uh, we split up the three, the team into three different parts to go spy out the land, different parts. Elena stayed with Charmin because she had a broken back. And then George and I had a quick lunch, and George says, let's go out sharing, two by two, just like the apostles. I go, amen, bro, come on, let's go. So here we are in Times Square. George goes, bro, why don't we evangelize all the street preachers in Times Square? Yeah. Good check, kill me, I mean, I've never evangelized all the street preachers. I go, let's do it. Let's go for it. It's nothing like being on the edge, is it? 
You know, it was awesome. Some of the guys, their faith wasn't true. But I went up to one guy named Ben, and he had a Pentecostal persuasion. But he comes to Times Square every Saturday and Sunday. He's a hairdresser, about 61 years old, distinguished-looking fella. Lives down Long Island. Comes all the way to Times Square to preach the word. Amen. To look like an idiot. And we're there. We go up and we start talking. We talk about the church. We talk about the kingdom. He says, it's coming. He goes, and of course he's Pentecost. He goes, he says, God spoke to me. Two weeks ago, he said, something new was coming. Wow. He says, I think it's you two. <laughs> Get this. He comes to church the next morning. He is so fired up. You know, this last admonition, though, needs to be looked at. What's the last warning? Do not look back. Or if you got a cell phone, do not look down. That's what Elena's always telling me, at least. You know, when you look back, and of course the idea is plowing, when you look back, you're going to plow crazy. You're going to go off course. And we, we look back because we're drawn to what we were. Because the labor is hard. And sometimes, like those on the Exodus, we start thinking about how great it was to be back in Egypt. How good we had it in slavery. And we start looking back, and we actually start doubting being a disciple. And we miss a Wednesday. Oh, something came up. We miss a Devo. Well, you know, you know, this and this and that. Miss Sunday, business trip, business trip. And I also had, you know, I, I, family too, family too. And as you look back, you're drawn back. And that's how you fall away. You know, you can still come to church and be falling away. Because you've looked back, and that's what you embraced. That's what you're all about. You know, when we were in New York on Friday night, it was April 11th, my 36th spiritual birthday. I was baptized April 11th, 1972. And I tell you, you know, it's just one of those moments. I just sat there. The New York mission team, their carmines are one of my favorite little Italian restaurants. I had my son, Sean, there. Sean's not faithful. And I had my son, Sean, with those faithful disciples. Was everything. But I knew what it took. I knew what it was going to take to build a great church in New York. Because there are a lot of people like Sean. There are thousands of fallaways out there yeah. that long for the kingdom. They look back. They fell away. That night, I, I, just, I just couldn't contain myself. It was just, it was over. It was an overwhelming spiritual birthday from God. The young people on that New York mission team, guys, they are amazing. They are incredible. The remnant people in New York, oh. Hearts of gold, so humble. You know, after Ben came, the street preacher. Uh, it's kind of interesting. George got into a strong talk with him a couple days later. And he said, you know, you know what our church is all about? He said, what is that? Going to all nations. He says, well, that's a good thing you come to New York City. We got all nations right here. <laughs> George says, I don't think you understand. We want to evangelize the people in New York, and then we send them out. But in our church, everybody's a missionary. 
He says, well, George, I want you to know I have my passport. <laughs> then they got more serious. He says, you know, you're a lot like Apollo Ben. You know a lot. You're bold and you're preaching about Jesus. But you know, there, there are some things you need to learn. And he was beginning to get the implication when he said this. This is a quote. He says, George, with this something new that's coming, I look forward to leaving me behind. You see, we cannot look back. Our resolution is to go to Jerusalem. Through suffering, through reduction, and be a death, death. Because we know that in Jerusalem lies the prize, a crown of life for us and all of those that we bring with us, that we proclaim the kingdom to. Thank you. God bless.